Okay, Romans chapter 8. If you can't preach after that, you can't preach, amen? Romans chapter 8. We're talking this morning about our promised revealing. You know, the book of Revelation is uh, kind of the big picture of the revealing of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I will kind of point out to you there in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1, it's not revelations, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's always a good starting point. And we also have a revealing that's in front of us in our experience as well as believers. And that's the point, that's the thing we want to talk about this morning for a few minutes here. I always have a hard time knowing exactly where to begin. I have listed here 18 through 25, but I do want to start at verse 16. I think we can stand up for six or seven verses, amen? Stand. If you can't stand up, that's fine, stay seated, but... If you would, stand with me as I read, and then I'll have a prayer, starting at verse 16. I'm going to ask you to kind of pay special attention to verse 17. There's something in there I'm going to bounce off of a couple of times in verse 17. But our main text is going to be 18 through 25. Okay. Verse 16, uh, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit of Himself, the Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co heirs with Christ, and kind of put this in your thinking cap, this next statement, seeing, now we're co heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. Okay, really stick that in your head. We suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. Okay, now our text, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, or they're not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us, or if you will, in us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. That's us. Okay? For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. And not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, or as King James says, first fruits of the Spirit, the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And that redemption of our bodies, that's where our revealing is going to be taking place. 24. Now in this hope we were saved, yet hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Again, verse 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed to us for the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your divine plan that you have put into place. We thank you for we believers that we are a part of that plan. For the glory stored up that's going to be revealed in us at your coming, Lord Jesus.
Father, we just pray that in our hearts, that in our minds, and in with the will, with every ounce of will that we have within us, that we would choose to follow you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Okay, back there in verse number 17, if children, if we are children, we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him. Okay. You know, suffering, how many of y'all really enjoy suffering? Did I get an amen? Robert, did you hear an amen? I, I didn't hear it. Nobody really enjoys suffering? Huh. Well, it's, well, look at James. Go to, um, well, first of all, Colossians 1.24. Go over to Colossians. Paul makes a remarkable, this is one of the most, to me, one of the most amazing statements in all the New Testament. Chapter 1, Colossians 1, verse 24. And it's kind of along the same idea of verse number 17 there in Romans 8, where it talks about we suffer with Christ. Paul says here in Colossians 1.24, I rejoice in my sufferings for you, for Christ. Look at this. For I am, I am, I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's affliction, sufferings for his body that is the church. Have you ever... Notice that verse, that statement where Paul says, I am completing or I'm fulfilling within my own body that which was lacking in Christ's sufferings for the church. Have you ever kind of caught a hold of that? We do wonder about suffering a lot of times. Now, like books have been written, why do bad things happen to good people? Those kind of things. And like I asked the uh, introductory question, how many of us enjoy suffering? Not, nobody bit that hook, amen. That, that bait didn't go anywhere. <laughs> but Paul says, I rejoice that I'm completing in my flesh that which was lacking of Christ's sufferings for his by the church. Paul writes there in Romans 8, verse 17, we are suffering together with Christ as heirs, as co-heirs of Christ. What's this all about? What is it all about? I'd like for us to know what this is. God wants us to know what this is all about. All right, James chapter 1. James is going to hit it right on the head right from the get-go, okay? James chapter 1. I do want you all to know that um, my wife picked out these new glass frames that I'm, I'm wearing, okay? You all need to know that. James chapter 1. And I also want you to know I'm preaching to Chuck also, okay? Verse number 2, look at this. James chapter 1, verse 2, 3, and 4. Consider it a great joy. Y'all hear that? What's the, what, what are we going to consider joy? Look at this. Consider it a great joy, my brothers, and we could include sisters in there too. Whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance or King James patience, but endurance or patience must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete Lacking nothing, okay? Count it all joy when you go through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have her complete work, which is what to make us mature, to help us mature. Now, yesterday was Veterans Day. How many veterans we have in here? Uh, the, just raise your hand, veterans, okay? Men, thank you all for your service. So being Veterans Day, as I was getting ready for this message, I was thinking about this thing about being complete and the sufferings that we endure to let this work of being perfected take place in us. I was thinking about when I went to boot camp. 
July 1969, I go to report to boot camp um, out in San Diego, California. Have you all ever heard of yellow footprints? The yellow footprints at boot camp? That's where they got, uh, in our case, it was 84 guys lined up on, and you're standing, they got these yellow footprints and y'all are on your footprints and you're in perfect order. And out comes, uh, if you're in the Marine Corps, drill instructors or uh, technical instructors in uh, the Air Force and Navy's got Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, they all come out. This all kind of takes place. And what, what those drill instructors, when they come out and they look at these 84 guys standing on the yellow footprints, you know what they see? They see 84 guys that in their minds, they are convinced, in the, the eyes' minds, they're convinced that the sole reason for that Recruit standing on those yellow footprints as they have come to embarrass the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force. And they are determined that they are going to make something out of that recruit standing on that footprint that he ain't become yet. He's going to become something. But he's got a long way to go. They're going to, in our case, they're going to make Marines out of us. Or they're going to make soldiers. They're going to make airmen. They're going to make sailors out of you. But that day when you check in to boot camp, even though you've raised your hand, you've signed, you signed on the dotted line, you took an oath, you got a long way to go before that guy comes out 13 weeks later, that officer comes out 13 weeks later and says, good morning, Marines. <laughs> and that drill instructor does not care what kind of suffering, what kind of agony, what kind of turmoil that he's going to put you through for 13 weeks to get you to the place that 13 weeks later you will be called for the first time in your life a marine or sailor, airman. Now with the sailor guys, we, we call them squids, amen. He doesn't care what it takes. He has one goal, one goal. He only has one goal, and that is to make a soldier, sailor, airman, marine out of you. That's his goal. And you know what you learn real quick? Let me tell you what you learn real quick. You better get in your head that your goal is the same as his goal. Because he's in charge. He's in charge of you. It took me a while to figure, now even though I was in the Marine Corps and my, and my ID card all around all around the edges of it, it said, Property of the United States Navy. And it took me a while to figure out that that was talking about me, not just that card, amen? I was a piece of property, amen? Piece of property. And that drill instructor had one goal, and I better get it into my head that my goal better be his goal if I'm going to succeed, successfully complete the training, amen? Let me tell you what. I thought about one of these days, need, y'all need to come in here and I'm, I need to have just a bunch of yellow footprints up and down these aisles. <laughs> because let me tell you what happens. My brother and sister in Christ, the day you and I come to Christ, the day you and I become a child of God, we confess, we repent, we put our trust and faith in Jesus. We are born again. You know what? It's kind of like we've signed up. <laughs> It's kind of like we've signed and we've raised our hand. We've taken an oath, so to speak. And then at that point, God becomes our drill instructor. Okay? And he has one goal. Only one goal. And it ain't to make me rich and famous. God's goal is not to give me a new Mercedes Benz, a bigger house, He's got one goal, and that one goal is to create the character of Christ in me. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's got one goal. And I like to think of it this way because I think this is the accurate way to think of it. If I have any other main number one goal in my life other than to become like Christ, I don't have God's goal for my life. Do I need to repeat that? If I have any other number one main priority goal in my life other than developing the character of Christ, I do not have 
God's goal. How do you think it would have went for us in basic training if I didn't have my goal, that drill instructor's goal? Well, let's say I, I had a goal that, um, I don't know, I wanted to live in an air-conditioned Quonset hut. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen, amen. He had one goal. God has one goal. And I really, I really kind of want to drive this home a little bit. We're, I'm getting personal. Is your number one goal in life to develop the character of Christ? If it's not, you don't have God's goal for your life. Okay? Is that clear? That, that kind of, then, then that kind of makes, the, you go on down there a little bit further, you know, the great verse, we, all things work together for good. Okay. We all love that little glib statement, oh, everything works together for good. Oh, yeah? Well, that, that, when you understand that God's working in our life to, carry, to develop the character of Christ, that's his goal, then you start to understand the suffering, trial, agony, heartaches that we go through. God is going to use them to create endurance, perseverance, going to use those things to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Like Galatians chapter 5, it, uh, Paul has a, a glorious, <laughs> inglorious list of the deeds of the flesh, you know, bitterness, anger, strife, all those, you can go read there in Galatians 5 about the, the, the fleshly things that God is committed to putting to death in our lives do you have any other goal is the main goal of your life is the main goal of your life to become like Christ I don't hear I don't hear people talk about that very I hear a lot of stuff about you know preaching about how to get this how to be better I hear a lot of the who, who in the world is talking about God only has one goal and that's to develop Christ in you. That's God. And that's the reason why we, sometimes it's kind of tough to get there. Sometimes in order to learn to be loving and kind and compassionate, we have to face things that aren't very loving, kind, and compassionate. And why do we have to face those things? So that we can learn to put to death our fleshly, carnal nature. I want to tell you, there are some times that I don't want to be like Jesus. Amen? There are some times that I would love to be ugly, hateful, snap, bite, yeah! And I can do it. <laughs> Amen? I know how to do it. My flesh, you know, it says that we put to death the deeds of the flesh. And one thing I learned about the old flesh, the carnal nature, yeah, it's dead, but it understands the power of resurrection very well. My old fleshly nature knows how to rise from the dead and raise its ugly head. Amen? Anybody say amen to that? Amen. You got one of them? It's not Christ, and God is committed to killing it, putting, putting it to death. And again, let me just say it one more time. He doesn't care what it takes. How many of y'all are married? <laughs> How many of y'all are married to somebody that sometimes, or sometimes, sometimes, just sometimes might get on your nerves a little bit? I can promise you I get on my wife's nerves, amen? I can get on Mary's nerves and never, never say a word. <laughs> I know how to just, you know, a, a certain look. Or maybe even just, you know, ignore. Somebody say amen. Don't you say amen, Mary. I have a new way that I really, I've learned to really irritate my wife to no end. This is so much fun. When we're having a discussion, you know, when we're having a discussion, I will, I will look at her and I will smile and I'll say, that's exactly what I was thinking, honey. You ought to try it sometime, guys. Get ready to run when you say that. Exactly. <laughs> You know why God puts us together, husbands and wives? Now, we think, 
we think the main reason is because we love each other. I love you, Dovey, you know, all that romantic kind of stuff. Let me, let me, God's got another goal, and, and you know, and to have kids. Uh, that's a great, great opportunity. But one of the reasons why God puts us together in husbands and wives is to create the character of Christ in us. And things happen in our marriage. We find out that, you know, sometimes our mate is not exactly what, they don't act, respond exactly like what we think they should. And it gets kind of irritating, you know, and frustrating. And sometimes our own human nature wants to jump up and smite back, you know, bark back. Amen, somebody? Amen? That's God at work. <laughs> That's God at work. He's trying to help you to learn to have a goal to put to death the deeds of the flesh because he wants to create humility and gentleness in your life. Okay. The work of endurance, creating Christ in us. Last point, 1 John 3, 2. I've been mentioning this verse is just keeps... <coughs> Blowing my mind. First John 3, 2. John, he's uh, the apostle John. He's pretty close. He's kind of on the inside with God. I mean, he's gotten, he received the inspiration of the gospel of John. First, second, third John, he receives the inspiration for that. He receives the inspiration for the revelation, the last book of the Bible. I mean, he was kind of in there. This is the apostle John who was pictured at the Last Supper as leaning over against the breast of Christ at the Last Supper. This is John who in his gospel always refers to himself, never by name, always refers to himself as the disciple Jesus loved. This is the Apostle John who while all the others have scattered and fled with the wind and fear trembling, only John is there at the foot of the cross as Jesus Christ is being crucified. Only John. Oh, Peter, you know, Peter, oh, I'm not going to leave you. I won't forsake you. Uh, he's gone. He's gone fishing. Amen. John, Christ on the cross, only John. Jesus looks at him and says, that's your mama. Talking about Mary. <coughs> Mom, that's your son. This is John. He was pretty close, Okay. But yet, with all that he had seen, all that had been revealed to him, he says there in 1 John 3, 2, he says, we don't yet know what we will be. In other words, we have no idea what we're going to be. But we know that when we see him, we're going to be as he is, like him. That's the revealing that God's after in our lives. When we see him, we're going to be like him. I never had thought about this until kind of thinking about this sermon this morning, this past week. It's kind of like Adam and Eve. You know, before Eve, there was Adam, you know, and God made all these other animals and critters and all that kind of stuff. And God had Adam go and name them all and stuff like that, classified them, named them and everything. And he got through that and Adam just looked around, you know, and says, well, there's nothing, none for me here. Remember what God did? God put him into a deep sleep, went in, cut a rib, took a rib out of Adam, and out of that rib he formed Eve. And when Adam came to, and <laughs> when Eve came to him, it's really, it's really wonderful in the Hebrew. It's kind of hard to convey it in the English. In the Hebrew, it's only two words. Um, the, the English says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In the Hebrew, it's like Adam goes, wow. <laughs> Amen, guys? Amen. Wow. This is bone. Listen, to this. this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I've never really thought about the, this before till this week. When it says there, John writes in 1 John, we don't know what we'll be, but we know that we're going to be like he is. How is that possible? I want to tell you how that's possible because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus, like Adam had to be put to sleep and the rib taken out of his body, Jesus had to die. Jesus had to be crucified. His blood had to be shed so that we could, if you, in, in a way, we could become like him, as John says. As a matter of fact, we're referred to as the bride of Christ, amen? 
Jesus gave his life for his bride. Now he suffered for us. Paul writes in Colossians 1 and says, I'm fulfilling in my flesh that which is lacking the sufferings of Christ. In Romans 8, verse number 17, Paul writes and says, we are, we are suffering, we are suffering with Christ. Counted a joy, James says, when we go through trials. Because what? We're being transformed into the character of Christ. One more time. That is God's goal for the child of God to create Christ in us. And my goal, our goal, needs to be God's goal. Amen? Amen. So think on that. Let's pray. Let's get ready for the invitation. Of all the goals that we might have in our life, goals, you know, not evil, good retirement, business, whatever the goals are, we shouldn't have other goals, but we should have the main goal, the main goal, okay? To become like Christ. So join with me. Let's ask God to help us make that our goal. If you're here this morning without Christ, you do need to be born again. As the scripture says, you must be born again. It's a one-time event. It's a, it's a transforming event when I realize that I cannot save myself, that I need a Savior, and that Savior's name is Jesus. I realize that I'm a sinner, and as a sinner, I am lost and undone separated from God, separated from the kingdom of God, separated from the mission of God. I'm separate, as a sinner, a lost sinner, I'm separated from God's um, goal for my life. The beginning point of turning to God is we call, the Bible calls it repentance. I repent. I acknowledge that I cannot save myself. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that if I die separated from God, that I will spend an eternity separated from God in a place the Bible calls a lake of fire. It's not a metaphor. There's no such thing in the Bible as an annihilation of the soul. The rich man woke up in hell and he cried out, I'm tormented, I'm tormented in this flame. And that's not even the lake of fire. That place where that rich man woke up is a place that's going to be cast into the lake of fire one day. And all these things, all the glitter and the glitz of this world, <laughs> my goodness, friend, Listen, where is the glitter and the glitz of the world going to be when one wakes up in a lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever? The glitter and glitz of the world will be long forgotten. All those things that tempt us, all those things that seem so delightful. Forever. What must I do to be saved? That was the question one cried out in the book of Acts. What must I, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you will be saved. Repenting is when I quit believing in me. I, you know, I confess I'm a sinner. We've all sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? It shouldn't be so hard to do. And I need a Savior. His name's Jesus. When you do that today, 
Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging we, we are totally dependent upon you. Lord, anyone without Christ this morning, God, speak to their heart. Help them to hear that gentle voice of your spirit saying, come home, come home. You've wandered far enough. You've wandered here and there. You've traced, chased dreams and schemes and they all, they all have left you empty handed. Come home, come home. And then, Father, for we, your people, heirs with Christ, help us to hear your spirit gently say to us, stand up. Stand up. Be counted. Make the glorious goal of Almighty God my goal. I don't think we would ever regret that. I don't think we would regret that in this life or the next. Stand up. Be counted for God's glory. Father, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Jennifer, you lead us.
Let me read this, verse 28, Romans 8, and a couple of verses, and this might make more sense now, putting it together. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he'd be the firstborn among many brothers. He's predestined that we would become like Christ. That's the all things work together for good. Chad, lead us in prayer, please, sir.